Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Emergency Home Learning Summit. Our guest today is Alice Keeler. Alice, what a pleasure. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Alice, what do you do? I am a math teacher. I've been teaching math since 1999, but I think most notably is that when I started teaching math is I inherited the laptop algebra program. So I've been pretty much one-to-one -one teaching math with computers for 21 years, which I think is unique. And then of course I have written some books about teaching with technology since that is what I have been doing. So my first book is 50 Things You Can Do with Google Classroom. My latest book is 50 Steps to Google Classroom, Stepping Up to Google Classroom. And I also have one on Ditch That Homework. And I'm a mom of five. Yeah, yeah. probably the most important at the end there. Yeah, tell us about Ditch That Homework. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I did a lot of homework growing up and it, it seemed normal. So when I started teaching, I'd you know, assign the kids a lot of homework. And I remember my first week teaching. Now, mind you, I didn't have a teaching credential. I have a degree in math. So I was able to get a job and then uh, go into the teacher credential program. So I literally had no idea what I was doing. And since I had no experience, they gave me the kids that struggle the most. And I gave them an assignment and they did terrible. And I gave them a zero because I thought, well, then they'll know what I want. Let's just say their response was a little different than I anticipated, you know, and as Dr. Thomas Guskey says that I've later learned is that low scores are not motivating. In fact, it causes them to quit and give up. So it just, I feel like my whole teaching career has just been, well, that didn't work. They don't love math today. So, you know, I give homework, they wouldn't do it. The only kids who would do the homework were the ones who really didn't need it. And so then I started reducing it and reducing it. I'm like, we'll just do these three problems. We'll just do this one problem. It didn't matter. They still wouldn't do it. And I thought, well, I got a lot of kids who are being very successful without it. And it doesn't seem to matter whether these kids do or don't. And once you start digging into the research, you can figure out that homework has a, an effective rate of practically zero. But while we can debate whether or not homework is effective, we know that it is highly stressful for families. And so uh, it just, we can do better. We can just teach in different ways that uh, reduces our reliance on homework. So why are there practices that are so detrimental to learning that perpetuate? I, I really think it's because we live in a system that was designed around not equitable practices. I mean, the original design of school was never to educate everyone and to think, how do I address kids with a learning disability from different backgrounds and who don't have money? Grades themselves were developed as a way to rank and sort kids out of Yale. And so we continue to have this A to F system, even though it is not based on a lick of research. And we continue to give zeros and give Fs, even though we know low grades are not motivating. And we just keep doing the system because that's the way it's always been done. It's a big boat to turn around and I'm trying to be gradeless this year. And it's, you know, it's tough because you have to have a lot of buy-in with students and parents and your colleagues. And I feel really blessed to be supported where I'm at, but it's tough. So as parents, we look to the school system as kind of a model. So how do you decide what schools do that's healthy and what they do that's unhealthy? How do I decide or how do schools decide? No, I'm curious as to how you decide. How do we decide? Well, I think a lot of my decisions are obviously based on my experiences to start with. I see kids aren't being successful and I love Ginger Lumen and one of her quotes is, if it ain't working, stop doing it. Right? Well, my kids aren't passing math. They don't love it. Even if they pass the test, they can't apply it to something else. So why isn't this working? So I've done quite a bit of research. I like to read research. I have a master's degree in educational media design. Of course, I wrote a whole thesis um, for that project and around online learning and materials. And then I was working on a doctorate in educational technology with an emphasis in games and simulation. I dropped out of that, so I didn't finish. But uh, obviously during that process, my research focus really led me to looking at grading practices, student motivation and gamification and how, what motivates kids in games, why can't we apply those same principles at school? So listening yeah. to others. You know, you go ahead. 
<laughs> well, I'm, I like to, I like social media. I like to engage with educators through Twitter and through Facebook groups and see what experts like Star Saxstein and Thomas Guskey and Ginger Woman and others who are doing things and see what they say are working and being willing to do something different. So it's hard for a normal parent to have confidence to do something differently than it's done at school. But we have all of these students and parents doing remote learning. Can they trust their gut? Isn't that dangerous? What if they get off track? What if the kid doesn't get into college? Can they trust that the parents, can they trust their gut? I think no. Um, the system's not really set up to give parents empowerment to say, this isn't working for us. We're going to do these other assignments. Um, I, I personally have said to some of my kids' teachers, like, uh, this isn't working. And they basically just tell them, we'll try harder, keep working on it. I, I very rarely, and I, I have had some wonderful uh, teachers that my kids have had where they were willing to make adaptations and to do things differently based on feedback. But I would say that's not my primary experience with, with my five kids. Um, so I, when I talk to parents, knowing that I've written a book about homework and that I'm a teacher, I often get text messages, Facebook DMs from parents just heartbroken that their kid is struggling. No one wants to see their kid struggle. And you know, what advice do they have? What should they say to the teacher? And then they're just not willing to speak up sometimes because they feel like they just aren't really part of the system. You know, we, we talk about, uh, partnering with parents. We usually just, just means we ask them to be the compliance police. Like, mom, can you make them sit and do this worksheet? Mom, can you make them do this schedule and do these things other than why isn't this working and what can I do differently? So teaching math for a long time, I've obviously had lots of parent phone calls calling and complaining about me and, you know, and they're, ah, you're the worst. You know, they're only doing bad in your class. I'm like, you know, and I, of course, at the time think, well, it's math, I mean, that's normal, right? Everyone does bad in math. And it took me a long time to realize that when they're calling and they're yelling at me, whatever it is that they're yelling at me about, is just the straw that broke the camel's back. They're frustrated because their kid doesn't feel successful. And I would give them advice like, well, if they just do their homework, if they would come after school and give them a generic thing to do that is not specialized for their kid. And it took me a long time to realize that I just need to listen and not necessarily respond back to what they're complaining, but say, I hear you saying this isn't working for your kid. What can I do differently? And being willing to modify for that kid, to do what I need to do for them to be successful and make a deal and not feel like it has to be fair. One of my favorite uh, people is Rick Romelli, and he, of course, wrote the book, uh, Fair is Not Equal. And what you do for one kid, one student, is not what you would do for another because their needs are unique and different. And I think that's one of the hardest things to overcome is this for educators, this idea of fairness. They have to give everybody the same thing, which of course is really impossible to do. But if I give them all the same assignment and I grade them all the same way, I think I'm being fair. But Rick Romelli, I think, points out quite nicely that that actually is, is not fair and it's not equitable. So whether or not it was true, prior to the emergency remote learning, there was a system and you figure out this, you knew the game, there was a game and it was all of this, and then you'd go to college and you'd get, play the game of college and then you'd get a job. So in the absence of those sort of standard procedures, how does a parent even begin to think about the education of an individual child? <laughs> oh my gosh, I wish I had an answer for that. You know, it's, it's easy to just say, well, I'm just going to take my kids out and I'm going to homeschool them. We tried that. Um, and then I thought, dang, I appreciate these people who get paid every day. Uh, it's hard to parent your own kids and, uh, and homeschool them. And like, I want to have a parental role. And then I've got this adversarial. I'm trying to make them do this schoolwork. And I've got other things I need to do. And that's just even assuming you have the level of privilege that you could even take the time out to stop and educate your kids. You know, I, I've been living in California for the last 21 years, and I have a lot of great neighbors. And some of them are incredibly hardworking immigrants from Mexico who don't know what the school system is. They didn't engage in the American school system and they don't know how to play the game. And that just makes it unfair because a lot of the things we do, you know, the advice I tell my kids, like you just gotta do this, right? Here's how you play the game, just get this done. I know this doesn't necessarily make sense. You know, not all the time, 
once in a while that comes up. But how does someone who isn't from the school system or didn't go to college and know what the tricks are, you know, how do they prepare their kids for that? And I don't have a good answer other than, you know, I would, I would work with some parents, but I can't work with all of them, um, you know, with my neighbors. I don't have a good answer. It's a dilemma, isn't it? It's a dilemma. Okay, so did you have a story of school growing up? What was your school story? Well, I, my dad is an engineer and you're gonna make me cry. And in my family, if you're not good at math, you are nobody. And I, I struggled so hard with doing uh, time math facts in fourth grade. Now, mind you, I was pretty good with word problems and fractions, but I just couldn't do math quickly. And I would just put my head on my desk and I would cry and um, it ended up, I just repeated the fourth grade. Uh, and largely because of this is I, I struggled in math. And I remember my mom and my sister having a conversation that I wasn't supposed to overhear. And my mom's getting on my sister because she got a B. And my sister goes, but Alice got a C. My mom said, yeah, but that's the best that Alice can do. And I feel like this was just a huge driver in my life because I just want to do better than my sister. But I've always just struggled with math. And when I got to ninth grade, I, algebra was so hard. I, like, I didn't understand this. And my, my brother, who's three years younger than me, he was really good at math and he was able to do all my homework for me. So I passed algebra and it wasn't until I got to geometry, which has a more visual approach. And I'm like, I really get this. And I, you never just saw me in high school without my math book. If the teacher assigned the evens, I do the evens, I do the odds, I do the whole thing all over again. And not because I need that much practice, but what I've later come to realize, because my hero in life is Joe Bowler. She is a professor at Stanford and she wrote the best book ever, Mathematical Mindsets. And when I read her book at 36 years old, she said that girls in particular wanna understand something in order to learn it. And being fast is not the same as being smart. I'm like, that is exactly right. I'm not gonna do it fast, but I can do it. You know, Google's named me the queen of spreadsheets. I have a degree in math with honors. Um, I've written a best-selling book on math. And it wasn't until I was 36 that I could confidently say, I am good at math, but the school system made me feel like I was dumb. You better get the right answer the first time or you're just not a math person. And I think that's a great disservice that we do to kids is to not let them see the beauty and creativity that math is creative and visual. Cool. Yeah, be my one of 5 million quotes from Joe Bowler. I guess that's my third one. Um, and so when we give kids more open-ended problems and we allow them to be think, thinking is very motivating. Thinking feels good. Trying to recall on the spot is very stressful. And so when we can take those away, I think that we can help kids to be more successful. So I do, I have a degree in math. I have a, a master's degree and I came from a very privileged background. Both my parents went to college and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And, but particularly in math, I really struggled. But because of my parents, I really know what the game of school, I know how to play it. And so I've done well in life and I, I thank my parents for that. But I think that we could do better teaching math. You're not the only one I've talked to who's felt wounded by their school experience. In fact, it's pretty common. Um, I'm wondering why it is that schools seem to produce this sense of not being good enough. I don't think it's intentional. No, it's definitely not intentional. I don't know one teacher who doesn't have a good heart and is really trying, but um, our teacher prep programs, I think in a lot of ways fail preparing teachers for dealing with such diverse populations. And I think we leave a lot of things like, how do you grade? We teach them how to make a lesson plan, but we don't teach them how to make an engaging one. And so you basically fall back on, well, this is what was done to me and it's what I know and what I'm comfortable with. And even though I've done a lot of research on alternative ways to do math, I find myself constantly slipping back to the way I went to school because it's hard. It's really hard. And there's just not enough time in the day. We don't give teachers, you know, high school teachers get an hour of prep. And that's assuming that you, even if you only had one class, 
my teaching partner teach four different classes. You cannot in an hour engage and prep students and do things differently and overcome the mindset of all the stakeholders who, if you, if you fail kids the traditional way, okay, we get that. But if you are doing things different, it's just change is hard. Change is really hard. It's hard for the students. It's hard for the parents. It's hard for the administrators who would like to support you, but they don't always get what you're doing either. And so then you're like, I give up. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm doing this. And that assumes that you've even been given an opportunity to hear of alternative approaches. Because our PD system, what do you get? Three days, three days a year of professional development. And it's a drink with a fire hose. No, oh, by the way, when we have these three days, we're actually going to just go over how to use your document camera and to log into PowerSchool. But we don't really teach you the math behind PowerSchool so you can realize that it's calculating your grades wrong. There's another rant for me another time. <laughs> So I always love to hear you talk about math and the connection with gaming and learning. Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, some of the research that I've done really shows that game-based learning is one of the highest forms of learning. The problem is the ability to create a well-designed game You know, with all the game theory is really hard. In fact, if you think about what are all the games on your phone that are really popular? You know, Candy Crush, Angry Birds, Among Us, right? Like it's, it's a small list, like it's hard to come up with. It is so hard to design a really good engaging game, let alone one that really leads you to learning. So oftentimes we abandon game-based learning even though what, what game-based learning promises is that you learn in a context. So you, in order to, to solve the challenge and solve the game, you have to understand the concept, which is different than gamification. Gamification is like Jeopardy. You play it in Spanish, you play it in math, you play it in history. It doesn't have anything to do with the content and you don't need to, and it doesn't help you understand the content. But we do know that gamification is motivating. The kids pay attention more when we do our reviews in Jeopardy. I'm a big fan of using Q-U-I-Z-I-Z-Z, quizzes.com, because it's gamified. When I give my students a quizzes, it's the same worksheet questions, but they fist pump, and they're, I can see them laughing, and they're challenging each other. And so even though it's the same content, I know that it's effective in at least a little bit engaging them, but it really leaves out still the context and the why and when would I ever use this. So when we talk about gaming, a game should really provide context. And I think that's something we leave out a lot in math. So this is my geometry book. It's the size of my head. And I am about ready to just burn this thing. Like every time I like fall back just because there's only so many hours in the day. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna pull some questions out of here. Not one of them could you possibly care about. I mean, just like, there's no actual context. And if they give you one, it's one that kids don't care about. Here's a table with legs that cross. Like, but you're not solving a real problem. And the deal with a game is it, it's real to them. So back in the day, I used to take Angry Birds that I on my iPad and I put it under the document camera. And I have the kids come up and they, we would take turns flinging the birds and we'd be cheering for each other. We're having such a good time. People are coming in from out of the hall to play with us. And then, you know, after a few kids have taken their turn, I would just put my hand up against the board, you know, the projection. I said, okay, you know, here's the Y axis. Where did I fling the bird and where did it land? Just give me any number, as long as a negative and a positive and it was reasonable, okay, and I'd, I'd move it. So then I'd switch from doing the angry birds and I would get my graphing calculator and I'd graph a parabola and I stuck it underneath the document camera and I said, okay, where did I fling the bird and where did it land? Wouldn't you know every kid in my class could tell me the x-intercepts even though they've never heard that vocabulary word. And even my kid who normally flings pencils at the ceiling, he's super into it. And then I write down, I'm like, okay, X is six, X equals eight. And I write it on paper, I'm under the document camera and we and like minus six from both sides and minus eight from both sides. And I get these two binomials and I don't even explain why I multiply them together, but I have them multiply the two uh, binomials together to get mm, kind of the equation for this. And 
not only is every kid into it, my kid who's normally at the back of the room flicking pencils, he comes up with his whiteboard, like super excited, like, and it's all full of math. What's the only thing that I've really done different here is I've given them a context and it's a context that's real to them. So I love that. And it makes a lot of sense to me. I also remember you talking a lot about um, level mastery that in games you would get to a level and you'd have to actually master it before you could get to the next level. And that we don't do that with math, but it would be really important if we did. I really think it would be. And that, that really was my focus for the dissertation I wanted to write. So I, I love Carol Dweck out of Stanford and there's a, a lot of great research I like to read about student motivation and goal setting. And so when you have a kid, I had a kid, he comes to me, he's like, Keeler, Keeler, I did my homework. And he's really excited and he's like, what's my grade? I'm like, dude, you haven't done your homework all year and you have failed every test. So, uh... and he goes from being really excited to being completely dejected. And I can tell he's not gonna do any work anymore. So what I could have said to him is like, okay, you were level five. This gives you 10 more points. You just need 20 more points to get to level six. What are you gonna do to get to level six? Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be level 25. But short-term goal setting is much more effective for motivating than saying, I'm gonna be president of the United States someday. You can't be president of the United States someday with a big goal. It has to be a series of short-term goals. So breaking it down into short-term goals that are tangible and attainable really helps students to be more motivated. So I hypothesize that if we just took the points we already have, we have the total number of points. That's, and I, it's a whole separate grading rant on how we shouldn't do that. But we have it, we just don't use it. And then we divide it by total points. So if a kid does all their work and they turn in work, they have an A. And then they turn in more work and they have an A. And they turn in more work and they have an A. Do you see there's nothing to goal set for? It's like, and I still have the same thing as opposed to a gamification situation where you turn and work and you level up like, yeah, like you feel like you've accomplished something. So I hypothesize if we just take that total number of points and just convert it over to, if you have zero to 50, you're level one, 51 to 75 points, you're level two. And you just create this scale and it's always forward progress and it doesn't move. Here's the problem with the ABCDF, what we do as a percentage was we do more points the mile marker keeps moving so if you're behind just keep getting further and further behind yet when you translate this into a leveling up situation if you go on a cruise for three weeks and you leave at level 13 you come back at level 13. now yeah you got a lot more to make up but you're not going backwards because that's not motivating like i was level 13 and now i'm level 10 you're like well heck with this but that's what we do in school you had a b and now you have a c and now you have a d and like if you work really hard you can scrape your way up, but by the way, the target keeps moving, so it's hard to, to make. So how do you goal set? You know, our goal is by the end of the week to get to level 14. And I hypothesize that students, parents, and teachers would naturally engage in short-term goal setting. And there's a lot of research to support the value and motivation of short-term goal setting. So I really like that as well in the goal setting. And I also felt like that one of the things I heard you say, what well, didn't mean you said it, but it's what I heard, was that in those games, you develop a skill and it may take you longer than someone else to get to the next level, but you don't go to the next level just because June comes around, that's right? Very true. And that's one of the same things if you study uh, games and gamification is that the assessment is that you finish the game. You don't necessarily have a, a test as much as, and then as you pointed out, it doesn't have to be on a certain date. And it's mastery, like you, right? You can't finish the game unless you figured out how to do it. You and I had a lot of fun years ago talking about teacher 2.0, about personal learning environments, personal learning, what did we call them? Do you oh, remember? It was such a long time ago. Because there were personal learning yeah, communities, there were personal yeah. learning networks, there, and then we had talked about, do, do, you know, have you created a personal learning environment where you have ways of getting information in, processing it and then pushing it back out. You feels to me like you are teacher 2.0. And it feels like parents kind of need to become parent 2.0 in this moment to help their kids figure out how you build this learning environment for the child. Have you got any recommendations? I think most teachers are really good people and they want your kid to be successful. 
and it's hard. It's hard when you have 200 students or even just 30 when you have them all day. And you, you need to say no. You need to advocate and really be a partner with the teacher. And the problem with that is it's, that's not necessarily natural or the way the system is. And so getting together with parents who can help you talk through ideas and, and give you ways to advocate and keep advocating. I always like to say I'm mama bear, right? I'm here to protect my kids and I want them to love learning. And if that's not working, I'm gonna work with the teachers to see how we can do that. And I have a lot of success, but a lot of people say, but Alice, you're Alice. And that's fair, right? I, I, I'm a teacher and I know how the system works and I've done a lot of research and have some level of expertise in a lot of things where I have jargon. I know all the teacher jargon. And so how does a parent equip themselves against that? And so one of the things I'd highly recommend is every parent reads the book, uh, Mathematical Mindsets by Joe Bowler and gives them some techniques and strategies and things. Just say like, this doesn't work, but then what do you want? And how do you know what you want? So maybe looking at having parents reading some of the books that are designed for educators so they can get some of the jargon and ask, why aren't we doing this technique? And there's a good chance the teacher doesn't know that technique because the PD system in this country doesn't give them enough time to access all of this. So unfortunately, what that means is we have to start doing some of the research as parents so we can sit down and have a kind meeting that starts off with a Starbucks gift card and say, I appreciate you. Can we talk about some of these things that I read in this book? And I'd really like to have my kid try something else because this isn't working. Okay, whenever I talk to you, we come up with really fun ideas. I think <laughs> I just came up with one. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot about pandemic pods right now, right? Yep. And this idea of families gathering together, which I think is more about safety than it is about pedagogy. It's more, yeah. can I have my kids socializing with another group of kids? And it's problematic in a lot of ways, right? Because it's going to self-select out certain groups. Um, but what about, what if we help people build parent pods, mm -hmm. which is groups of parents who can talk to each other about what they're doing to advocate for their kids, to face challenges, because it does feel like this is, you said, well, parents should all read this book. And I'm thinking, most of the parents listening to this are gonna say, I get to the end of my day, I, I, I could, I'd read a paragraph and I'd be done. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what was that reaction? I, the book is so good. You won't believe it till you read it and you'll buy it and it'll sit on your shelf for a long time. And when you finally decide to read it, it is life-changing that you realize this is the math education I want and I know how to advocate for it. Okay, so in a parent pod, one parent could read the book and then tell the others, and someone else could read a different book and tell them. And they, I, I feel like uh, in order to meet this moment, parents kind of need to talk to each other. They need to feel some sense of community. This is what we're doing with our kids. This is how we talk to the teachers. Like hearing you talk about how you, mama bear, protect your kids, that's probably helpful to someone else who's feeling like, oh, can I really do that? What do I do? Well, I, I do that with a lot of parents. I just to encourage them in ways to speak up where they feel like they can't even call the school at all. I think Facebook has really taken that on. There's so many Facebook groups and a lot of them are with parents and teachers right now are in these Facebook groups like crazy. I've got 34,000 people in my teacher tech Facebook group and I had just started that at the start of the pandemic. And so I think one of the things we've really seen is, is people feeling, like you said, feeling isolated and we're all struggling. And I think one of the best things that have come out of this, and by the way, I think there's been so many great things to come out of this. We just have to come through the fire to get there uh, is really this need that like, I can't do this myself and I can't do it the same way I've been doing it before. And I'm gonna need some help in, in, in forming of groups. And it's nearly universal that people are finding some place to talk. And, and that's true, I think, also with parents. You know, they're frustrated. I know my kids, I have, like I said, I have five kids and they were doing the distance learning and it wasn't great. And my kids were crying every day, you know, and the challenges were, we're all together in the house at the same time and everyone's online at the same time. Well, great, I have 125 gigs or megabytes 
per second um, of bandwidth. And even then, when you divide it up amongst seven people, it starts to degrade. Now, what if you're not paying for the $125 package of internet every month? So there's a challenge, everyone doing video at the same time. And then, you know, I can hear all of them. And we're trying to talk over each other. And then it's just a steep learning curve for everyone. The kids don't know how to use Microsoft Teams. They don't know you how to use Google Classroom. And the teachers, not only do they have insufficient training on it, they don't even know what it looks like from the student side. And so how, what can you assign and how much can you assign and what can you expect? Ooh, wouldn't that be the million dollar mousetrap? It's, it's challenging. So, you know, and that's just in my situation where obviously I have a lot of privilege that all my kids have a room to go to and I have enough bandwidth and all my kids have their own device. And then what about parents who, you know, lots of different situations. Yeah, and I feel like if you, as a parent, you have a personal learning plan, you may not have articulated it, but you have a plan in your life for learning what you need to learn and how to participate. And it would be interesting because as adults, we recognize we're going to have very different ways of going through those processes. So we develop our own sort of unique learning journey through life. What does that journey look like? And the ability to hear someone's plan, so someone, a math teacher with five kids, that plan may be very different than me if I have a completely different circumstance, but it does feel like we as adults at some level have to figure out our own personal learning journeys in order to help our kids. Well, that's for sure, because my kid's not your kid, and it becomes real apparent that what I, my kid needs, and by the way, I have five kids, and now you also have several, and not one of them are alike. And that's even just the challenge of parenting with one, two, three, four, five kids or more is I only have these five and I know them really intimately and I know how different they are. And I just struggle with like, why can't you just be like your sister, right? Now throw that at a teacher who doesn't get a 15 years to get to know the kid and they have a 30 to 200 kids in the room. Um, so yeah. It, more important than ever is that the parents continue to have their plan for their kids and, and working out what they want and advocate for them. Although that comes from someone who's both parents were college graduates and I know the school system really well and it's easy for me to say that. I know my kids learn a lot from YouTube and not once have they ever gotten credit at school for anything that they've learned on their own. And I think now is a great time to give kids credit for what they've learned. Well, that goes to the argument that largely what schools do is to sort and accredit, meaning you, you're passing, you're going through the game, you're figuring these things out, and you're going to have the following opportunities because you're able to figure certain things out, which is not really in, generous with regard to individual talents and strengths. I want to finish with kind of an interesting question. I've long thought that temperament was a great hidden factor. It's almost like we don't talk about what may be the preeminent factor in a child's educational experience is that they come built differently. So just like we have yeah. different body styles and types and I'm tall and someone else is shorter, I believe that our brains come uh, comparably pre-wired, right? So a child has his father's sense of humor or his mother's temper or whatever it is. And so that there's a degree to which there's there can be significant differences in how we accomplish things. And yep. I feel like we don't really talk about that. Yeah, you know, I think my middle daughter was born 13 and gosh darn it, she's going to do everything her own way. Oh, and I think she's going to be awesome in her own way. And whatever normal paths that we would say, like, you do these things and you'll be successful. And like, that won't be true for her. But we don't have those conversations. And she does she was doing independent study for a couple of years because she really wanted to do hip hop dance classes. And, you know, the school doesn't accommodate kids really well if they want to go train for the Olympics or, I mean, my daughter wasn't trained for the Olympics, but I just had to give her a path to do things her own way. And she was doing really well. So that's an interesting second dilemma, right? Which is a child can feel that they're defective that they, you know, in your circumstance, that just heart-wrenching overhearing of the conversation um, 
that's the best Alice can do. And you probably felt, oh, I'm defective. But sometimes a parent can feel that their child is defective because the system, the child doesn't match the system. Right. And I know I had to go through that experience myself to, to renounce it, that it was not okay for me to feel like my own child was defective. I think that wasn't necessarily very popular up until relatively recently, where we've really put a lot of emphasis on helping bring equality situations in school for kids in special ed and mainstreaming and, and doing some things, you know, and I, I look at my own kids, which have different challenges. Turns out my youngest son is farsighted. I, I assumed he had some sort of a reading disability. Um, he just, he just such, he just wants to give you a hug and share. And then at school, he's hitting kids. It's like, wait, 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 what happens here? Well, he's frustrated because he can't read. And so then he lashes out and we've been dealing with that for kindergarten we pulled him out of kindergarten. We did kindergarten again and then first grade. And then here we're in second grade and we're doing the distance learning with the second grade. And he still can't read. And I don't know how to help him. And he's not being successful in school. And I'm tired of getting the phone calls that he's punched somebody or he's not doing something. And I'm like, you guys, obviously something's not right. How do we help them instead of just like calling me and putting them in the principal's office all day? And I, you, you, you feel low. Like how, to just, how do I just get my kid to be able to sit still and, and not hit anybody? That's my goal for the day. It didn't hit anybody today. And it's, and it's hard. It's really hard. And I'm really grateful for the teacher he has right now. She works so hard to get him um, yeah, special reading intervention, because now that we figured out that he's farsighted and he just needs classes and needs some training with his eyesight, now we have to catch him up from kindergarten, first and second grade. And it's a good thing we caught it now because if it's third, fourth, every year that gap gets wider. And then you can imagine how frustrated kids and parents feel that they don't fit in. I'm a crier. <laughs> so there are realities to life making a living, working in the culture and environment that we live in. Yep. But maybe it's just important to remember that there are things that are more important than anything else. Yep. And that our relationship with our child and the child's own individual journey are more important than a particularly difficult circumstance at the moment. Yep, that's a fact. And those are some things I've definitely figured out. And then of course, that we all continue to struggle with is how do I value my kid for the individual that they are to advocate for them, that they feel that they're important, however they are, and not that they have to be a certain way to be successful. Thank you, Alice. Yeah, thank you.